even though this life gets tough, said you gotta keep fighting. fighting. And even though it gets hard, it's gonna get you hard. You gotta keep striving. But you gotta keep striving. Through the fears and the loss, the, the tears won't turn off. The tears no won't tears turn your heart's crying. Yes, Hold on to his words. Hold Lean on, on him. It gets better. It gets better. Right the toughest war you ever face will be domestic. It's elementary, it's been this way for centuries. Co war was raised against, against us. Take off the blindness, you will see. You'll see that it ain't about them gas prices. It's all about who whip the nicest. All about them deals on bundles. Harrow fleet, don't make them up. Face beating red bottoms. Dead beats, we hear about them. Fit it up from here to toe, but never had their children's do. Wonder why they dying by the dozens, but it's simple, yo. Just listen. It's time we stop ignoring facts. It's time we take our family back. Fix the root and then attack. Stop making moves without a plan. Control emotions, then we stand. Calling on my kingdom and to come together. Take this land. We gotta fight, our future depends. Get the head back in order, cause that's where it begins. Invest your all into your garden, water the roots to the end. Nurture the family tree and let the food feed all men. Just listen. Welcome to another episode of A Mile in My Shoes, where we ask the question, how can we say we know someone if we've never heard their story? Y'all, before we get into tonight, how have y'all been doing, man? I must say I am enjoying each and every one of these stories to the fullest. We are now almost approaching 100 testimonies, y'all. In the past couple of months, this will be our 86th story slash testimonial. We are flying. God is doing some amazing things. Without any further ado, we have a, a wonderful young lady who has a major story to tell. She gave me the bits and pieces of it, but we're going to take some time and allow her to express this story. And the things that God has not only delivered her from, set her free from, and I guarantee, without a doubt, that it's going to inspire many people out there. Without any further ado, y'all, Mrs. Lisa Martinez, how are you? Hi. <laughs> I'm pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> like I say, you gave me the, the small version, and, and I'm going to sit back and uh, look, we're going to take it back to the beginning and share this story. Look, the people are going to comment along. And look, you have free reign. <laughs> Let us know who you are, where you're from, and take okay. us to the beginning. All right. So I'm Lisa Martinez from Western Colorado. I was um, I was born in Canyon City, and um, that's about all I've known about my roots for most of my life, is that I was born in Canyon City, and I was adopted. I was um, placed for adoption and it was a closed adoption. So I didn't know anything about where I came from or my family. All I could really do was daydream about that <laughs> for a lot of my life. And um, as we get towards the end of my story, um, it's it's a miracle that I get to share. It's pretty cool. I can't wait. Um, but so, yeah, I was adopted into a just a middle class family. Both of my parents um, were working people. I was second to be adopted. They adopted my brother. Um, uh, three, he was born. He's three years older than me. And uh, he, it's same deal. He was adopted from a different family. Um, and so, yeah, we just lived a middle class life, I would say, on the surface. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, I, I did. This didn't occur to me till much later as I have processed my story. So, you know, it's kind of different to tell it from now yeah. as opposed to like growing up in it. There was so much I didn't understand, so much like struggle and stuff that I didn't understand until now that I've gone through a lot of healing. But um, I went to daycare. So I my mom adopted me. She wanted children more than anything. Like she just wanted to have kids. I'm not sure why they couldn't have kids. But um it's interesting that she got to adopt me and my brother, but she didn't get to spend much time with us because they both had to work. And so I spent a lot of time in daycare and uh, you don't get you don't get nurtured or really cared for much in daycare. You just are kind of there right. <laughs> you know, right. with all the other little kids and we're all just growing up, trying to discover who we are. Um, 
I remember several different daycares that I was a part of. Um, some were good. Some were not so good. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I don't remember very much of some of those years. I have like bits and pieces. Um, unfortunately, at one of the daycares I was in, I was molested probably when I was about nine years old. Yeah. You know, and I hid that for a long time. Like I even forgot about it. It's those those, right. repressed, those repressed memories, how we have the ability to do that. I don't know. But it wasn't until I was like in my later 20s that I was I was watching like the Oprah Winfrey show or something at home on TV. And it just snapped back into my memory. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that happened. Mm. And. Um, yeah, I shared it with my husband. And uh, he didn't he didn't really think much of it. I think some people kind of think, well, that's just something that little kids do. <laughs> like, right. Um, you know, oh. I. And so that was kind of an open door in my life um, with both my parents working, spending a lot of time in daycare. There was also a lot of other shenanigans that I got into in daycare along those kind of same lines yeah. um, of just exploring sexuality that we really shouldn't have been with other kids and things like that, that just really, that's where the enemy got in Yeah, life. I think, um, he really likes to attack little kids, um, <laughs> because he's a coward. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, and so once I got to a certain age, um, I no longer was in daycare. I just remember being home alone for the summers um, at school, uh, you know, for the summer vacation. My parents were gone and my brother and I were home alone a lot. And um, he was kind of mean. We still have a relationship. So I feel weird <laughs> kind of sharing this. But I love, you know, I love him. He, he and I's relationship is strained. Um, last time we spoke, he told me to forget I ever had a brother. So that hurt, you know. Yeah. yeah. We're not really talking much anymore, but we just, we were, he, he was adopted too. So we both had, what I've come to discover is that adoption, especially closed adoption, and I'm not against it, believe me, I'm a pro-life. I work for a pregnancy resource center. Um, I'm not, there's just a lot that we've learned about adoption since the eighties. Um, and so he and I were both dealing with those issues of that separation that we were not aware of as children. And so um, we both ended up getting into a lot of things, trying to kind of heal or deal with that pain that we felt. Um, I just well, remember- tell me, tell me yeah. for the people who don't know, how does that process work and how to inform us? How does how does that adoption process work? Um, for closed adoption, there's no um, I think back then in the 80s, um, there was. Yeah, just not a lot known about the psychology of it all and about a baby being separated from their mother. And so um, you're just basically I was taken and I didn't know all this until later on. So I'm trying to keep that part kind of um, in the shadows. But yeah, you're you're just yeah, you don't there's no information given, no information given. You're just um, you get a new birth certificate that has your adoptive parents names on it. And um, yeah, that's that. And then I mean. I think I made up stories about who my birth mom was. Yeah. I kind of just made up stories. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's there's nothing. It's just a big blank in your life. And you wonder. You definitely wonder. Right. And um, they. I think I was told that my, my mom did like sign up to be found later on when I got older. But that's really all I knew. And I just, yeah, I can't wait to share (laughs) um, everything. But um, so getting a little bit older and getting to where we were home alone a lot. um, My parents divorced when I was about 12. And so they sent me off to California to stay at my grandmother's house for like three weeks. And I didn't know why. I just thought, okay, I'm going to California. And um, I came back and my dad was gone. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I guess. Okay. So let's go back a little bit. So we did go to a church. We went to a Presbyterian church. And so I learned like Sunday school songs there and such. Um, And I was, I was, my mom would put me in the pageants. (laughs) She, um, she really liked to dress me up. She liked to curl my hair. She liked to doll me up. Um, And she did. So I was, I would sing in the pageants and I played the bells some in this church that I can remember, but I did not learn about Christ. 
Mm. I did not learn about, I don't remember learning about salvation there. I learned about salvation with, um, in my friend's backyard. <laughs> like, and that's where I accepted Christ later on when I was about 14 years old, I think. Gotcha was when I came to believe in Christ. So yeah, we went to a church. My, my mom worked for a, um, she worked for uh, an electric company as a bookkeeper starting out, but she was so loyal to that company later on. She worked there for like 30 years and was eventually the senior accounting clerk. And then my adoptive father was in law enforcement. Um, he was a, he was, he worked for the sheriff's department. And then later on, he worked for the department of corrections at a prison. Um, actually just down the road from where we live. And so, um, yeah, decent working class people. Um, back then in the eighties, I don't feel like they did a whole lot of background work and on the, on the parents who were going to adopt, you know, like they do now. I think they do a lot more investigation and like the people have to work out their own stuff. I think more before they're allowed to adopt. And so um, my parents uh, did the best they could with what they had. <laughs> and so I certainly, I don't want to hurt them by sharing my story. Um, the one that's still with us. Yes. And uh, so growing up in daycare and then going to school, school was rough. I didn't fit in anywhere. As an adopted kid, you don't like have an identity. You don't, you know, it's like, so I had like, I, I, hung out with the girls, but I didn't get along with anybody. There was a lot of fighting amongst myself and my girlfriends. We did like Girl Scouts and things like that, but I never really felt like I belonged anywhere. That was kind of hard. And I um, spent much more time with my dad's side of the family because they lived here and my mom's side of the family lived in California. And so I, I grew up around them until my parents divorced. And when my parents divorced, is like they divorced us too. So like this family that we had grown up with all of a sudden, that was hard. I, d- I didn't know at the time though. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize, you know, until later on that um, there was this missing, this also missing piece of this other family. So just a lot of abandonment. I would say that's a big part of my pain is abandonment. Yeah. And also like just feeling like rejected and feeling very alone. And um, so my brother and I, once we got to where we didn't have to be in daycare anymore, I guess we were considered old enough. Um, we started staying home summers by ourselves. And that's when like marijuana and stuff entered the picture. And I started smoking cigarettes when I was probably when I was about 12. I want to wow. say Um and that was a tough addiction. That was addiction number one, I would have to say, was the first thing that I started using. And so I would smoke all the time and um, steal cigarettes for my brother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I steal cigarettes. My dad smoked too. And so, yeah, around 12 years old, that's young to be smoking. And I know that's a lot of people's story. Yeah. Um, and my brother would get me stoned. So at like that kind of age... Yeah. Yeah. Starting to use pot. And I never really liked it. I just used it because that's what everybody was doing. But I never really liked it. It still to this day, it just made my heart race and it didn't I didn't feel good right. <laughs> using it. But um so staying home alone, and another thing that I got into was um pornography. And that's a big thing for me to share with people that I don't know who are watching, but you know, I want to be brave and I want to share. Because it was an addiction from that, from the point I first, you know, looked at it. And it was video. It was video that I looked at. And um, at a very young and impressionable age, that was how I began learning about, like, sexuality and relationships. And so I would go out, too, also after that and seek relationships with men and sleeping around with men um, ages 12, 13, and 14 just looking to be loved. You know, I thought that's what, you know, I needed my, my mom. I had some behavioral problems. I had some anger issues when I was in my young teens and would, um, would throw things. I broke, I don't know how many cordless phones I broke. I would just have these outrageous outbursts of anger and fighting and my brother too. And after my dad left, you know, my poor mom, she didn't know what to do. 
Um, she already was in her own battle with depression. I think she battled depression most of her life. Looking back, looking back. Um, and she was just kind of a workaholic, a very, um, she was a very kind woman, like very kind, very loving, but lacked parenting skills. Mm. So, you know, I wasn't really parented, my brother or I, we were just kind of left to do our thing, you know, especially after my dad was gone. Um, now, now break that down. Cause that's a, that's a major point you just said. Yeah. He was very loving, very kind. Mm -hmm. Parenting. Yeah. Distinguish those two for all of us <laughs> and the listeners. No, because that's a major point. Yeah. So, I mean, I had what I needed materialistically. We were a middle class family. Like, so if I think maybe that was their idea of love, um, we would go to the mall and we would go shopping and do things like that. But um, there was no, I wasn't, I never got grounded. I never got punished for bad behavior. Um, and like, I left home at age 15. Nobody came after me. If that nobody came after me, like I just left to be with the man who is to this day, my husband, which is a miracle, <laughs> which is a miracle. Uh, we, he and I have been through literally thick and thin. Um, but I guess, yeah, nobody helped me with my homework. Like nobody pushed me to do good in school. Um, yeah, I was just on my own. It's profound how how lonely I was. I can remember sitting in my home by the fireplace and just thinking like, and it was a, it was dark, you know, and thinking like, is this it? Like, I was just so sad and like, where, <laughs> is this what life is? It was painful. I remember it being incredibly painful and lonely. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I went out looking for boyfriends, looking for love and my mom. So I had lots of behavioral issues, lots of anger, both my brother and I, my brother punched holes in walls. It was very violent. There was a lot of yelling and screaming, um, matches, you know, one time it was really bad. I still remember, uh, I got real mad and I pushed my mom against the wall and like, yeah. I, that's just, it was awful. I should, yeah. All those emotions yeah. bottled in and not, not understanding when we that young, how to process them all. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's how I spent most of my life until these past few years of opening up all of that stuff. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, a lot of fighting and screaming and my mom would just go in and sleep and my brother would bring friends over and we would party and drink. Um, I was sometimes invited and allowed to hang out with his friends. Um, I did sleep with some of his friends. Um, and yeah, sometimes I would be allowed to hang out. Sometimes I wouldn't. We would go and my brother and I, we had a trampoline and we would go and get all the cushions and pillows and blankets and everything from the whole house and put it out on the trampoline. And he would jump off the roof. I would just kind of watch. <laughs> I wasn't like brave like he was. He was very brave. And, um, yeah. And that's, yeah, just my memories and getting stoned, smoking cigarettes and going out. I would sneak out of my house a lot, yeah. sneak out of my house. And one time I stole my mom's car and just like probably about 14 or 15 years old I was. And I stole my mom's car and went to this place where they were, these people were like camping and just having like an ongoing party. And I went up there and hung out, um, just really stupid stuff. And uh, yeah, I I would look at the porn every chance that I got and just got really addicted to to that dopamine hit of using that. And uh, yes, yes, sir. So misusing my sexuality for most of my life until later on when God restored that. Right. I, um, I, I remember going through a time where I was like, I don't even, yeah. Don't even want to like even be intimate with my husband because I was like, I just need time for this to just be restored because it was I, I remember realizing that I was misusing my sexuality. I didn't know what and what so, brought you to the realization. What was it? Just part of my healing journey in 2020. <laughs> so much happened in 2020, didn't it? <laughs> Everything happened. <laughs> I do. I think God really did the same thing that he to, to a lot of people that he did to me in 2020, where I just fell apart. 
I just fell apart. I lost it. Like I, um, I got so emotionally distraught from hiding behind all these masks. Cause I went to work, I got a job later on in life and I can circle back to that. But, um, in 2020, I, I ran away from my family. I have four children, four beautiful children and my husband. And I got so stressed out because I was in a really unhealthy church situation as well. And I just ran away. I got in my car and I started driving and I was never coming back. I was either going to end my life or I was going to run away and never come back because I was, I was so stuck, didn't know how to express myself, didn't know how to tell anybody like I'm struggling, <laughs> you know, I'm struggling. I can't hold on to all this stuff anymore. All this trauma. Yeah. And I mean, the porn that's trauma on a child. That's like being sexually abused repeatedly. Oh, it just gives me goosebumps to even I, think I, about it and to say I, it out of my mouth like that. Yeah. I heard of it like that. Yeah, because it's I'm I'm validating myself and like what I've been through. I haven't shared my story like in this kind of a fashion yet. Look, so I'll drop some heart for her being so courageous <laughs> and sharing this with us. Please, y'all. This is this is blessing me already. <laughs> Look, you're not alone in, in a lot of those battles. Please believe yeah. me. Yeah. Please believe me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me on, by the way. I meant to say that at the beginning. Thanks for having me on your show. I really uh, like what you're doing. It's awesome what you're doing. Look, look, I appreciate you for sharing. And I promise you, like, if you would hear the the the, the inboxes of people being touched by these stories, like, I, I could never talk about it. Uh, I can't believe somebody else went through this. So yeah. everybody who's sharing. Sure. And that's, that's why I, I want to share. How much we all have in common, but they make us believe that we're so different. Right. It's mine. <laughs> like, yeah. We all battle with a lot of the same issues. We all live in the same broken world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's so easy to be exposed to that stuff, especially even now more. And so, um, yeah, moving forward, I was playing around with boys and men, having sex with boys and men. And um, I met, I met, I met who, the guy who's now my husband when I was 15 years old in January, approximately January of 2020. It's real hard to remember. I struggle with dates and times and things like that. But um, we were, I was at a party and he was like, he asked me what color my eyes were. He's like, what color are your eyes? I was like, green. He's like, oh, you have blonde hair and green eyes. I've never met anybody with blonde hair and green eyes. And of course, me just looking for that attention was like, oh, <laughs> you know. Right, right. Um, but at the time, I was sleeping with another guy. And then, um, so we met at that party. He gave me his number. And then a week later, I was at my friend's house and I called him up. I was sitting in her hot tub and I called him up and was like, hey, come hang out. And um, so we started our relationship and for some reason, well, I left home. I left home and ended up with him. So I was still in high school, but I got caught smoking at, high, at my, in my freshman year. And um, like they brought me back to the school and that was the day I left school and never went back. So I, I can remember I was really mad. They wouldn't let me make a phone call, which sounds like jail. <laughs> yeah. But I threw my backpack up against the trash can and was like, screw this place. I'm out of here. Cause nobody cared. Nobody cared. Like, yeah, they, I was one of the misfits. And so they really, I feel like they really cared more about the preppies. That was my perception. It might not have been true, but there wasn't any teachers that kind of came after me or cared much. And so I was like, I'm out of here. And I never went back after that day. And I went down to be with this guy, my husband, Josh, he's a great guy. <laughs> he wasn't always a great guy, but God, <laughs> but God, yeah, God held on to both of us. And, um, I think that he has big plans for us to help people. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, but so I, I moved in with him at that time at age 15. And like I said, nobody from my family like came after me and they're working people. Like it wasn't, I'm not like from, you know, like a poor family where they didn't have the resources or anything like that. So that has puzzled me too in my healing journey. That's something that I've given a lot of thought to of like, well, of course my dad was already gone 
And he, he really didn't have much to do with us after that, even though he lived like right down the road. Yeah. And uh, I have forgiven him if he sees this. <laughs> like, it's just, it is what it is. So, um, yeah. And, and my, my husband, who was then my boyfriend, he introduced me to Crystal Meth. And uh, the first time I did it, you are hooked. Yeah. You are hooked. I, um, yeah, I smoked it, never did use needles or anything like that. Praise the Lord, because that's a whole other yeah. hell hole that I'm so glad I never got into. But, um, I was definitely addicted to crystal meth for, I used it for 10 years and, um, it's an all the time thing, everyday thing, but well, not, but so four months after I met this guy, we were pregnant with our first kid. Wow. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So at age 15, I was pregnant with my first kid, my daughter. Um, and yeah, by the time I was 16, I had her in January when I was 16 years old. And, you know, but he stayed. He stayed. And so that is one of the things that I'm grateful for in my life that because around here, like many, there's so many single moms. I work with them working for the Pregnancy Resource Center, you know, and so I'm always I always practice that gratitude of having a guy who stayed and, but, but we lived in a lot of dysfunction. Yeah. Yeah. But we stayed together. And, um, so we, I was 18 and pregnant with my second child, Dakota. And then I was nice. So by the time I was 22, we had had all four of our kids. He did have a child with another woman. Um, and she lived with us. There was relationships there and all that jazz. Uh, we were just young and dumb and doing drugs. And it's that it's a whole lifestyle of just poor choices. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I definitely have raised that kid just like he was mine by God's grace. And we've never treated him like, you know, any different. We've just it's been we've co-parented him yeah. pretty well, tried not to fight. Um, but yeah, using, so I was a stay home mom all those years from the time I had my first baby, um, mm -hmm. stay home mom, um, until I was about 26 years old and my husband got hurt at work and we got married in 2008. We got married in 2008. And that was really when our, when our like addictions in our life began to slowly like turn around because he took marriage very seriously and so he was like, once, you know, once I marry this girl, then I'm going to, you know, shut it down. Take it seriously. Yeah. 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 And I mean, he's always was he well, he would he would leave. He would go out and party and things like that. And I would be home and I would be sad. And I went through all of that of like more loneliness of like, is this really how it's supposed to be? But I just took care of the babies. And this was he, he was my safety because I I left this other home of dysfunction and um, <clears throat> he was my safe place. So I was very like submissive to him. He was pretty controlling, um, never physically abusive, but pretty controlling, pretty. Yeah. yeah. You're going to do what I say. And, you know, just but I was safe. <laughs> you know, I was safe. So I was like, OK, <laughs> you know, OK. And so that was like for 17 years. That's kind of how a relationship was. And so in, in none of this time was I ever finding my identity. Who am I? <laughs> You know, so I dropped out of school um, and didn't get that independence of, you know, graduating high school and then going on to college and being independent. I just went at 15 years old. I basically went from, you know, my home and my dad had already left and into this person's life. So he was kind of like a father figure to me a little bit. He's only three years older than me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. That was my safe place, but I still did not know who I was. I just had all of this trauma that I grew up with from the day I was born, really. The day I was born was my first trauma. Yeah. And I can't wait to share more about that. I'll get there. I'll get there because <laughs> it changed my life. I'm all in investment. I'm <laughs> so, um, uh, so going through, I was about 26 years old and I got my first job. Um, because he got injured and I was like, well, okay, I'll go to work. <laughs> having no education, having, you know, just been a mom. That's all I knew was mom and addiction. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, partying with my friends, you know, we would have friends over and we'd have parties. And so I got a job at a hardware store for a couple of years. And um, I was a cashier and it was cool at first, but I'm, 
I'm intelligent. And so I want to learn. I love to learn and read books and grow. And um, I've all, I, I loved school, even though I left school. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I got two, two years into that and was like, I really want to go get some more training. I want to like, you know, just, I want to reach my potential, I guess is what I was thinking. And I went to technical school, got a couple of business certificates. Um, I did really well in my class. I, um, like it was cool for the college. I went to a, a local technical college and they asked me to redesign the application, like the application for admission. And so I did that and it was like, it was so beautiful, this document. It was like quarter inch margins and it was so pristine with all these check boxes and everything. I was just so proud of myself, you know? Mm -hmm. And the day I graduated and I got to wear that cap and gown was one of the happiest days of my life. Cause I was yeah. like, I, you know, I did it. And it was um, just a couple of semesters, not a degree. I, um, I want to get a degree, we'll see. I'm, I'm working on school right now, but it is so hard for me to do school because I actually, I mean, I have brain damage from everything. My bangs. I'm like, anyways, they're getting in my face. Um, so yeah, I went to school and then I got hired as a, right out of, right out of tech school. I got hired as a, um, an admin at the local chamber of commerce. Hmm. Loved that job. Loved that job. Did really well, but inside still had all the stuff like like that wasn't really me even though like, it's like this these masks that you're wearing and i'm getting this praise from all these people and so i'm like okay i'm doing good i'm doing good like this is because people are you know i'm, I'm doing well at this job and it was actually the position was kind of a mess when i got there so i got in there and i cleaned things up and like fixed all the quickbooks and accounting and things like that yeah. um but while I was working there, I was, let's see, ages and dates is really hard for me. It was in 2015 was when I graduated. So that was when I started that job. I would have started like in June of 2015, mm -hmm. um, which would have made me, I don't know how old I was, 28. I don't remember. It's weird. I don't remember if my mom, my adoptive mom, yeah. was still alive at the time. Um, I need a calculator so I can figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> because so um, numbers, I don't do well with numbers. Two, so 2023 minus 2015. No, that's not right. I was about 28. I can't. We um, would you. <laughs> Um, during this time, I just can't remember because it's, it's important because my mom, my, my adoptive mom, she took her own life. Wow. She took her own life. So I got married when I was about 24. And so she was, she was, yeah, she was already gone at this time because she was still alive when I got married in 2008. Oh, duh. Okay. Wait. So she, she took her own life in, in like 2011. And um, that was rough. Another blow. Huh? Yeah, that was rough. And I had, I did not have, so like she divorced my dad and she was not, she was not with anybody for the longest time. And um, she married this guy out of the blue. We were like, who is this guy? You know, she went on like a blind date with him and married him. And my brother was really put off by it. He was like, this is weird. She's been independent for all these years. And, you know, all of a sudden she wants to marry this guy. But my brother was like living in her old house and she wanted him to leave and he wouldn't leave. So I really feel like she kind of wanted this guy's help. And um, so that marriage wasn't good. <laughs> that her Hi. Hi, Lucretia. <laughs> that marriage wasn't good. The second marriage. And, um, he would call me and he would say, you know, your mom is here. And she, she would take like a bunch of cough medicine and a bunch of pills and she would kind of get stoned in that kind of way. Um, and I, I didn't know what to do. Like I was too young and well, emotionally with my trauma, I was probably like a 12 year old Yeah. at age 26, about age 26 was how old I was. My wife is a therapist and she always explains that. Yeah. Uh, you can be a certain age, but due to the trauma, emotionally, you still an adolescent. Like mm -hmm. 
He had to break that down to me. Yeah, and especially me. using using meth. Yeah. I started using meth at age 15. And so like my development like stopped there. And so he would call me and he'd be like, you need to come and help your mom. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, <laughs> right. I've got, I don't know what to do. I can't, I can't handle this. Yeah. So I never would, I never could get myself to be brave enough to go up there Yeah. and to her house and stuff. I just was afraid. I was so afraid. I didn't know what to do. And um, so about a month before she passed away, she wrote me a note and I, it came to the mail. She wrote me a note in the mail, had a $20 bill in it. And she wasn't doing well about a week before she passed away. She like had a seizure and got in a car accident. Wow. And um, so she wrote me this, I was in my car by myself. I checked the PO box and got this, this, it was like written on one of those grocery list things. And she just, it was basically kind of like a makeshift suicide note, but it, it wasn't the real one. It wasn't the, it wasn't this time. But so I go home to my husband with this. I picked up my son from preschool and I go home to my husband and I'm like, I don't know what to do. So we called for a welfare check and the cops go over there and uh, they wake her up. I think that she tried at the time and um, she she didn't go through with it. I think maybe she had like taken pills and it didn't, it didn't take, it didn't take or whatever. And so she gets on the phone with me. I'm like, mom, what is this? Like, what's going on? I was freaking out. And she was like, Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. And I had left home at 15. So her and I were just kind of friends and she would, she would take my kids. She really adored my children. She would take my kids and especially my oldest daughter um, like every weekend and would spend time with them. They loved her. That was their Nana. My daughter was closest with her. My, my younger kids don't remember her as well. But um, at that, you know, I didn't even, after I got that note and stuff, she's like, don't tell anybody, everything's fine. And I just was like, fine. Okay. I just kept trying to cope with my own life. Yeah. That I just, I, I didn't know what to do with it. It's not like I could go up there and like have her committed. Right. right. You know, obviously I still am, have hangups around this, you know? And so not very long later, she had called me and she had said something on the phone. I mean, it's been, it's been several years and she had said something on the phone about like, if I die, I want to be cremated and stuff like that. I think that was the night before. I think that was the night before. And I was like, well, okay. You know, cause she had just done a, had been to a funeral for her husband's sister or something. So I kind of thought, you know, like my thought, my ability to think and my thought processes were so messed up that I just, yeah. yeah. And it was the next day that her husband called me and said that she was gone. And, um, Yeah. I just can't, it's, yeah. it's just crazy. Yeah. And it was, it was really hard. So the, it, it took a week. It took a whole entire seven days for the funeral to take place. The longest week of my life. I had to be the one to go and tell my brother in um, one town over about 40 minutes away. And he had no idea. He had no idea. Their last conversation was really heated. Um, it wasn't good. I think that he had yelled at her. He was mad at her because she got into that car accident and he was like, you need to take better care of yourself, you know, but um, she was my brother's enabler. There's no other way to put it. She was my brother's enabler. And so, but he loved her. He loved her and um, she loved him, but it was just dysfunctional, like love, like what we were talking about earlier, parenting and like doing things where we think we're loving somebody, but never, yeah, never receiving correction. And then later on, always being the one to like bail this person out. Um, isn't really love. Right. Right. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so I got my first job and then 2008, that doesn't make sense. So I got my first job probably like after she had passed away, I think I really can't make it all make sense in my mind. And then I, Yep. Went to technical college and I graduated from there. I worked at the Chamber of Commerce, did really well there. That's why I said that, because when my mom passed away, um, I started looking for a church. I started looking to get plugged into a church. I got plugged into this little house church that my 
my dad was going to, and it was really, it was not good. They eventually like called me a Jezebel and like kicked me out because I, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I promised them some of my like inheritance money because I wanted to give, but I ended up saying, okay, well, I'll give you this much. But then I, instead I'm going to buy my dad like an Xbox or something yeah. and I'll just only give you this much. It was so silly. I was so young. I didn't know. And it ended up being this whole thing. And I left that church and I got involved in another church. Um, I, I went for a little while um, and everything was fine. It was a, um, a word of faith church mm-hmm. and kind of health, wealth and prosperity gospel is what I came to learn later on is what it yeah. was. Yeah. Um, and the, I just, this is like, like going to be kind of harder to talk about, <laughs> but it's probably happened to others. I would guess. Um, I just, I formed this emotional attachment, not only to the church, but like also to the pastor. And so, um, I first started going, I believe, to this church in 2017. And as I started going more and more, I started just trying to find my identity there. It was like I knew that Mm -hmm. God wanted me to be in ministry. I always kind of knew that. Um, And so I really just kind of got really out of balance and gave like my whole heart and everything to just helping this church (laughs) and like trying to grow this church, doing everything for them. Um, And the pastor, like I started, I started communicating with him over text and it's like sharing because he was the first person that would listen to me tell my story. And I'm like, I just want to be understood. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was. And uh, it shouldn't, and I don't think he knew any better really. I I don't think he realized how broken I was. And so he thought, well, sure, you know, this is okay. But I became incredibly attached. Um, and I was a people pleaser. And so I would like do, you know, whatever, always. Yes. Just burning myself out at the extent, at the expense of like my family, my marriage and everything. I just would be going to this church several times a week, really trying to fulfill the call I felt God had on my life. Um, I thought that I was, you know, doing the right thing, but it was so unhealthy, so toxic. And so in 2020, God opened my eyes and um, I actually watched a documentary called American Gospel. Yeah. And kind of that just kind of opened my eyes. And yeah, I think that, yeah, that was when I really fell apart in 2020. So breaking away from this church and the trauma bond, like what Lucretia said had happened, the shame it was like all the shame of my whole life just came out and I lost it yeah fell apart um I couldn't function almost had like what I would say was a nervous breakdown um I couldn't really speak it was and it wasn't just the church experience that was everything everything in my whole life I could not hold on to it anymore so again like God started taking me apart it was painful but taking all those masks off, everything I had hid behind addictions. I mean, when you talk about addiction, like meth and cigarettes and porn were not in, like just sex in itself, food. I was, um, that was my coping was just addictions, just using really whatever. I still struggle a little bit with food, with emotional eating, it's but I'm getting you, there. It's funny you talk about the church situation because you rarely hear people actually confessing that that church yeah. the cover cover up as well yeah I, I i have these conversations with my wife all the time i say it's easy for us to identify negative cover-ups like oh the drugs the alcohol mm-hmm. it's when it becomes those other things that are good yeah it's much harder to recognize those you know the cigarettes you know the drinking too much you know the any yeah drug but, but when it I'm I'm going I'm using church all day every day to cover up something too. Yeah. So just just you pointing out that's that's a major thing yeah that does not get spoken. Like codependency and people pleasing. You can do that anywhere, you know, but and I, I did it in this church. 
of like, yeah, just be, just be pleased with me. Let me serve you. Let me do, let me give you all my gifts and talents, everything. Just be, just love me, <laughs> accept me, love me, you know? And so that was like my family. And I, um, yeah, I didn't know any better and neither did they, you know, neither did they. And later on after I, I left in August of 2020 and, um, yeah, just breaking away from that was a trauma in itself that I really had to work through in therapy. Um, so, but in 2020 was the beginning of my healing journey. Mm. And so let me tell Hold you now, on. let me tell you now this really great God thing that happened. So I left the church in August of 2020 and my husband um, planted a bug in my ear and said, why don't you put a post on Facebook and look for your family? And I was like, mm. there's so much fear around that around looking for your family, uh, you know, for, you daydream about it. You think about it. You wonder like, are they still alive? Are, who are they? What does she look like? You know, all this stuff. And, um, and then one day I got home from a football game, I think it was, and I just got this spark of courage. And my son took a picture of me holding up this sign that I had made that said, looking for my family. I was born at St. Thomas More hospital. I had discovered, and I put my birthday and I put my phone number and I'm not even kidding you. I posted it in the Canyon City message board and mm. my my biological aunt saw it in like 45 minutes. I got wow. a phone call <laughs> from my biological aunt and she called me and she was crying. And I'm like, how do she's crying? And she's like, I think you're my little niece. And I'm like, how do I know I can trust you? I don't trust anybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And um, yeah, and it was, it was my, it was my aunt. And so not too long after that, I met my mother, my biological mother. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Total God thing, like timing and everything. He knew that it was the perfect time and adoption reunifications don't always go positively. And so I'm, I'm seriously grateful that mine did. Um because I was well received and they were all so happy to have found me. Yeah. And um, during this time, I can't remember if I read this book before or after, but somebody put a book in my hands called The Primal Wound. Hmm. The Primal Wound. And I read this book and for the first time in my life, it was profound. It was profound. I felt like the author of this book understood me. Like everything that I felt as an adopted kid. Yeah, it was crazy. I just, I would recommend it to anybody. Hey, babe, make sure you uh, put that on, on the list, babe. <laughs> it primal changed the primal wound. It's by Nancy Newton Barrier, Nancy Newton Barrier. And I just, I mean, I laid in bed one night after reading several chapters out of that book and I'm crying and my husband comes in, he's like, what's with you? And I'm like, dude, you don't even know. Like, that's and that was when I realized that I had gone through most of through my whole life without feeling like anybody knew me mm. or understood me because I didn't have bonded relationships with my parents. They were just my parents and they were dysfunctional even at that. Yeah. And, you know, because because we all live in the same broken world, you know, and they did not do therapy or anything like that to help and heal themselves. So they were just these two you know, like broken people that needed healing, trying to raise adopted kids. When you adopt kids, you've got to know that they need therapy. They need to help have an understanding of what it is they feel from this separation. And that's why they do open adoptions more now. I'm pretty sure closed adoption is no longer. Yeah, it's rare. I feel like it's rare, but I don't I don't know that for sure. But um, so I read this book and I found my family. And um, my grandfather, my grandfather, um, he's passed away now, but I got about two years with him before he passed away. And he came to my house and he hugged me. And it was like, it was a hug like I've never experienced before. It was like a God hug, like a father hug, like he'd been waiting to hug me. <laughs> my, it was so healing oh. just to meet these people and to know where I came from. I that that definitely was a huge turning point for me that's amazing so, yeah it was amazing it's still pretty amazing so my um my biological mom um she's she's not well and that's probably all i'll share but um i don't know if she'll ever see this or not but um 
she it's also been for her to find me she's been the most stable that she's been since like her 20s it's been very stabilizing for her to have found me because that separation is so hard to separate a baby from their biological mom and sometimes it's necessary you know i mean i'm glad they didn't choose the alternative i'm certainly glad they didn't choose the alternative because like here i am and i have four beautiful kids that are impacting the world and um you know, they're impacting their world. At least my kids are amazing. And so you just, they're yeah. Impacting the world too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. And so I started like therapy. I started going to therapy. Um, and that's been a journey. I've been through different therapists and I've just had to like walk this out and learn emotional maturity, learn emotional regulation, learn about who I am, learn about God's truth mm. and grabbing onto God's truth. Cause like when you've been through all this kind of stuff there, you're so full of lies, like your mind and everything is just so full of lies of worthlessness. The biggest lie that I battled was you're crazy. You're just, you're crazy, you know? Um, and I believed that I would say it, and when I would fight with my husband, I would be like, why do you even love me? Like mm. asking him genuinely, why do you love me? Why do you want anything to do with me? Yeah. Um, so, and that's, it's, it's finally starting now. Like about a year ago, I feel like I could look my husband in the eye and say, I feel like I'm finally in recovery, you know? And so I was diagnosed with complex PTSD in, August of last year. Mm -hmm. And that in itself, I got to go get a, an actual psych evaluation because I have, of course, we have Google. Right? We, get ourselves right. Into, right. we get ourselves into so much trouble with Google because we look up all this stuff. I was convinced that I had ADHD. And so as an ex crystal meth addict, I had a, a doctor who was kind of experimenting on me with Adderall. And that was not fun. It was like, yeah, it was like being high all over again. It was really triggering. Um, but I thought I had ADHD because I have real troubles with like focus and um, things like that. I can sometimes be kind of all over the place. And uh, so finally, because my daughter works at a behavioral health place, I got a, I got kind of fast tracked in to get some psych testing and um, all the other diagnoses. I was diagnosed at one time with borderline personality disorder, which might make sense. <clears throat> Um, I would thought I had bipolar, just struggled with like, what's wrong with me? I'm so out of balance. I'm so, I struggle so bad to just maintain constant fear of, um, of rejection. And like, yeah. you want to, you want to have healthy relationships, but you live with this constant feeling of like, somebody's mad at me. I've done something wrong. Um, I still, I still battle with that. Actually, I've been battling with it recently, but, um, so yeah, I got diagnosed with complex PTSD in, in August and everything else like went away and I was like, okay, <laughs> this is what I can work with and I can recognize my own symptoms and becoming more self-aware. And I've gotten plugged into a more healthy church, um, but it's still hard because I want to have healthy relationships like with, I want to have like friends. Um but it's hard because it's, it's this attachment. I've never had like healthy attachment. Like it's yeah. always insecure attachment. So I, it's really weird. <laughs> look, we all can relate. Really we all, look, I don't know how many people out there relating, but I definitely can relate to you. Okay. I, good. I, mm -hmm. Cool. So, I mean, yeah. And my, my husband, like I said, he used to be, he used to be pretty controlling. It was, it was me who helped to lead him to the Lord. And he'll say that because I'll get, you know, weird about like my work for the Lord and everything. I'm getting better about that too. But um, he ended up getting saved at a church in Montrose. It was actually my mom's church that she used to go to. And um, slowly but surely, like God has transformed him too. And our marriage is now actually like pretty healthy. You know, he's had to learn from 2020 until now, like he actually, he took the beating of like all of this stuff coming out of my soul and he never gave up. I can remember sitting at the table with him and just crying and saying, please don't give up on me. Please don't give up on me. Cause the healing was taking place and I would still have 
like emotional meltdowns of just not being able to deal. And he stood by my side, like stood by my side. And now we're in marriage counseling together, learning how to communicate. And so I'm so grateful for what God has done in him. He's we're, we're not the same people yeah. <laughs> that we once were. And like, this is the real me just sitting here talking to you. And I, I love working with people. God brought me to work at the Pregnancy Resource Center in 2020. And I was a mess in 2020, but I always daydreamed about working there. I was like, because I was working at the motor vehicle. I was working at the Department of Motor Vehicles. And I left there in, I think, February of 2020 because I was start like the, the breakdown was starting. I was like, I got to go. I can't I can't work here. I can't work full time. Um, it just got kind of worse from there. But I thought, well, some friends of mine were like, you know, maybe you should go volunteer at the Pregnancy Resource Center. And so that's what I had intended to do. And then I told the lady kind of the gist of my story at the time. So much has happened since then. But she was like, do you want a job? And, uh, and it was just part time. So I was like, well, OK, you know, because from leaving in February until then, I had strengthened a little bit from leaving the full time job. I'd had some time to kind of gather my bearings but was still going through things. And um, so I've been working at the pregnancy center since then and really grown in my um, skills and abilities to work with young moms. I've worked with so many cool, stories sir. of people and like, but I'm really comfortable doing it. I just like God uses me and I'm just really comfortable doing it. So I love it. You said something so profound, man, like an oxymoron. You said, <laughs> You said when everything starts falling apart, that's yeah. when it began. Yeah. Yeah, that was a deep one. <laughs> when yeah. everything started falling apart, that, and that's that's the truth. That's when yeah. all the masks come off. Yeah. That's when you finally, because we can't heal with the mask on. No, no, and I wore many. I wore many. No Working way. girl, addict, <laughs> mom, wife all that stuff, but I was never myself, never myself. I didn't know who myself was. Yeah. Yeah. Never got a chance to discover that. It's so amazing though, so, on that healing, healing journey, as the, the mask start to come off, mm -hmm. God starts to show you like, without anything else connected, just you being you is like, because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like you don't need any type of mask whatsoever, no. just how he made you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the more it, it is like we spent our whole life putting the mask on and covering up who he made. Yeah. And have to peel it all off to realize, mm -hmm. you no, know, he made you a one special, beautiful, <laughs> all of the above we can think of. Yeah. You didn't need any extra. Yeah like perfectly seasoned, perfectly painted, no extra needed. Yeah. We, it's just we, the lies you say, like the, the lies. Oh, so much of the lies. You yeah. Put all of this on and just take off the mask, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, but I didn't, I didn't do it. I guess I just, I came to the end of myself you know, and did a lot of crying out to God of help me. Like I'm struggling. Um, and of course, one while that's going on, the enemy is also trying to keep you from trying to keep you in the masks, trying to keep you in the lies. And so it was a um, as far as like the spiritual experience and the emotional. It, I couldn't even describe it to you of just ups and downs and fear and. Um just having to hold on. I did a, a Bible study called Bound to be Free by Marta E. Greenman. Um, and that one was really, really helpful. It was a very scripture rich, in-depth Bible study about healing um, from a lot of this kind of same stuff. And so that really helped me a lot. And um, yeah, I guess just kind of walking it out. It's been messy. It's not linear. <laughs> <laughs> it's not linear. Uh, but today for me to be brave enough to call you and say, hey, I want to tell my story like I a couple years ago. No way. That's major. Yeah. I was driving in the car with my, my wife today on the way uh, to church. And we just talking about life and situations. And, and, and when you when you coming from like addictions and everything else, you know who, who you are in those states. Yeah. And 
and I'm I'm driving, sitting next to her, and I'm like, babe, I was like, it's amazing. I was like, because I look at life circumstances, and I see how I'm able to stand without all those devices. I say, I'm not the same person anymore. Yeah. Like, when you've been in all that, when you <laughs> wore all those masks, you know the difference between you here <laughs> and you when the masks start coming off. And I, and I just looked at it, I was like, I'm not the same person. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm comfortable in my own skin consistently. Consistently. I still have battles. I still struggle. And um, I'm trying to go to school. I want to get my bachelor's degree. Um, but when I started doing, like, real college, my ability to, like, read and study. And I'm in speech therapy because of, like, just brain damage. Like, I just have, you know, memory and things like that. And so I'm going to try again. I took a break. I'm going to try again because I want to be a counselor. But school is like this huge mountain, <laughs> this huge mountain that's going to take a lot of grace and help for me to get there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. I got another question for you. Another yeah. question. Yeah. How, how important or how helpful was the therapy? Because, you know, so many people struggle with, with therapy and the stigma. And anytime somebody comes on and they speak of therapy, Mm -hmm. I'll always get them to speak on how how has therapy and going to therapy helped you? Tremendously. Tremendously. I've seen lots of different therapists. Um, when I battled with, when I was a part of this other church, I had Christians telling me not to go to therapy. Mm. And that was hard. That made me feel really confused. And um it was hard for me to go. And so then I ended up going to see because of my insurance, I needed, in, I needed insurance to pay for it. So I went and saw a, um, a, a therapist who wasn't necessarily a Christian therapist at first. Yeah. And um, I really saw her regularly and I liked her after a while. It, it got to be where it was just talk. And so then you have to recognize that, but still yeah. being able to go in there and just talk about what's going on in your life in itself is really helpful. Yeah. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Just like, and I, um, it, with Lucretia, I think I had this conversation when I went to one of her um, beyond it support group things where we just talked about like, if your leg is broken, you go to see a doctor. And so like, right. if your heart is broken, like God heals the brokenhearted. And one of my favorite scriptures is Psalm 103 that talks about that, how he crowns us with love and tender mercy and he heals all our diseases. And he, you know, all those scriptures of like, and beauty for ashes, Isaiah 61, beauty for ashes. I clung on to all those things and God, God has done that. He, he can get in there to those deeper places, but in the moment when you're just struggling and you need somebody to talk to, yeah, that's unbiased, that's not going to tell your secrets to like, and you can say anything to, as long as you're comfortable, it's so helpful to, you got to get it out. You got, you got it out. <laughs> you got to get it out because it. So that's what happened to me is everything was just bottled up. I didn't know how to express it. I didn't know who to talk to that would understand me because um, my husband saw a lot of like the outbursts of like, you know, and he didn't understand. He didn't really know what to do a lot in some of those times. And then I did I did some polyvagal therapy, which is interesting. Um, it's just about getting still with yourself. It's about self-compassion, which you know, um, I didn't do that too long. I've had people recommend me to do EMDR and I haven't taken that leap yet. Um, I may. My wife, my, my wife is on here. Uh, <laughs> look, I'll tell you this. Yeah. I, I'll share. I did my first session. Two of weeks EMDR? Ago. How, how long ago? Two weeks ago. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? It was, it's, it's very different. Look, yeah. I'm gonna I'm continue on. Yeah. Look, look, having a wife that's a that's a therapist. Look, I, I thank God for. But yeah. I, I did my first session, and it, it's it goes deep. Yeah. Well, and I think that I do need that because, like I said, I still struggle with fear of relationships. Like, mm -hmm. I'm plugged into this new church. I've been going there for about a year. They're pretty aware. It's kind of cool. A girl that I grew up with. Um was a good friend of mine growing up until I left school. Um, her older sister came around to the PRC here recently. And I got, God, 
God helped me to start a little small group of girls that I've been doing Bible studies with. So cool. Like I never would have thought, you know, I used to daydream about doing these kinds of things and now I'm starting to do little bits of them. But, um, she, her, so her and I kind of struck up this friendship. I started them out on this unraveled roots class was what we did was unraveled roots. And it was about getting down to your roots and figuring out like what happened to your parents that in turn hurt you yeah. that you can in turn like acknowledge and forgive so that you can heal unraveled roots. So cool. And all these girls got so much out of it. And they were like, after that class was over, they were like, we don't, we don't want to stop coming. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. <laughs> Let's keep going, <laughs> you know? And um, so it's been going for like a year or so. And me and this girl um, struck up a friendship, my, my old friend's older sister. And so, but her wife, her, her and her husband ha um, actually run this church that I've started going to. Yeah. It's a cowboy church, cowboy at the cross. And um, their their testimony is so cool. Totally God thing. Like they have this building and everything all debt free. God's paid for it. Um, he's moving. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, and so I've been there for like a year. You know, they know a little bit of my story. They had me over for dinner, you know, and I shared. But um, like a little bit of it. I just I struggle with this fear of relationships, this feeling of wanting to like run away. You'll go this far and then you'll be like, nope, I'm out of here. Not <laughs> one. Out here. That's all. Not want to be hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, that's a, a struggle for me. But I mean, yeah, as far as like, excuse my dogs. That was my, oh, look, my dogs. I got one right beside me. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, but therapy has helped me like so much. And so now my husband and I are seeing a Christian couple who do therapy here. And I sometimes see the wife on my own. And then sometimes he and I go in and see the husband and wife. And they have helped us so much so um yeah go therapy it's like we're we're three-part beings and god uses other humans god god uses other humans just like doc like god uses doctors and medicine to sometimes heal people you know like so yeah there's nothing wrong with therapy and it's a bummer that though that the that those people at that time believed like that you shouldn't go yeah you know i don't, I don't understand that stigma yeah I Drum roll. Are you are you ready for the for for our final question? Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you were on stage with a microphone, all the children who were giving up for adoption and going through the situation that you had to face, what would you tell them? Mm. That's a tough one, Joe. Um, God has a plan for your life. Mm. And you're here for a purpose. You know, because we're adopted into God's family. So adoption is it's a it's a really cool thing like I, I, what i see is either way if i had stayed with them i still would have lived a broken and hard life or if i had you know gone over here um god uses all of our pain everything we go through like to lead us to himself oh. if we will humble ourselves and seek after him and, and ask for his help you know <laughs> If I have more <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah. How did, yeah it, how did it feel? Huh? Telling the story. How did it feel? It felt pretty good, I think. I was like, am I going to be able to, like, take up a, a whole hour? <laughs> you know, because, well, you know, it'll be like 10 to 15 minutes. And, you know, it feels good. I, I really hope to hear back, like, fruit from this and um, that it helps somebody. Because he had been really prompting me to do this way before. And then through Lucretia, I saw what you were doing. And you, you said, if you want to share your story, just send me an email. And I was like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Yeah. I like, I want to write a book and all that stuff, but we'll see. Um, we'll see what God has. Look, do it. <laughs> I will try. Look, I was, I was blessed by it. Cool. I was 
Good. I'm I was good. blessed to share it. Thank you for the opportunity. Look, a lot of stuff that you touched on, a lot, of, a lot of points that you made. Look, it definitely blessed me. I'm yeah. Proud. Cool. Look, we appreciate you, and yeah. uh, I'm proud of you. Thank you. I'm proud of you. I, I know the courage it takes uh, to be open and share your story. Yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely proud of you, and I appreciate it. Yeah, and God restores, like God restores. He does that. That Isaiah sixty-one, He gives us beauty for our ashes is true. It just takes time. You just walk with Him. You just keep seeking. You just hold on. You just trust Him. You know, just keep walking and and reading His Word, and you know, get into a good church if you can, because like you need the body of Christ. Don't just be all isolated. Yeah. You know, I spent a I spent a year away from church after I had left that other one, but I got I knew I had to get plugged back into the body of Christ because that's where your strength is. If you can find a church where they let you, you know, like just be real and be who you are, and mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, God will use it all. God uses it all. <laughs> if you was blessed by the night, can y'all drop some hearts, please? <laughs> hearts on that screen, and look. We thank y'all all for tuning in with us. Yeah. Look, I hope y'all was blessed as much as me. I need y'all to share it. I, I already see that we have a few people that already shared. Y'all share this. Y'all tag anybody that, that y'all know that will be blessed by this story. Look, thank you again, Miss Lisa, for, for sharing with us. Look, and, and hopefully when, when you finish this book, you'll be back on to let all of us know where we can find this book at. Hopefully. I just yeah. need to sit down and write it. And look, if you if you know anybody that want to share, tell them it's a safe place. Okay. If, if they ever feel comfortable enough to share, please come and share. Okay. Look, this isn't for, for likes, this isn't for none of that. Just a right. stuff where people can just be themselves and tell the story and yeah. hope somebody else can hear it and be helped. Right. And to God, to God be the glory. All glory to God. Because he's yeah, he's there all along walking with us. And um, I don't know where I'd be without him and his grace. Like <laughs> Yeah, he held look, on to us. Look, y'all have a beautiful night. And look, every time I get off, man, I just be overjoyed, man. <laughs> I, I, that's why I said I hope I don't know what it does for the people, but I know it does something major for me to okay. hear these stories and testimonies from people. It's yeah. like he he tells us to share these testimonies, but look, getting to sit in front of so many people and hear them, it's, it's just doing something to me. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. But it's it's doing something to me. I don't know what it's doing, but it's definitely changing me. Cool. Not out on some type of level, just seeing how we all connected and how we have the power to help each other just by sharing. What yeah. We did. Yeah, definitely. Look, so y'all have a good night. We're gonna go out with a song, and y'all look, continue to love, give, and keep God first, man. A ball in my shoes with humble Joe. Y'all have a good night. It's tough, said you gotta keep fighting. fighting. And even though it gets hard, it's gonna get you hard. gotta keep striving. You gotta keep striving. Through the fears and the loss, the, the tears won't turn off. To my queens, I see y'all in a different way. It's more to y'all than posing. Posting pictures on your Facebook page. God giving power to uplift a man or make a slave. Speak life into our dreams. Our task down and watch us fade away. Know your position. Cause you're vital to the family structure. No replacing any mother. Careful how you treat your love. Elegant, heaven sent etiquette is like no other. Her love is better than butter biscuits right out the oven. Know who you are, don't let this world define. Shape or mold you, God's daughter, queen of nations. There's no box to ever hold you. Life creator, who protect the heaven sent. Love injector, backbone, best gift ever. Worth more than hitting treasure. I speak life, cause this world is trying to turn you cold. Replace that all the stone with flesh. We need your love to make us whole. Kick back your crown and hold us down. Together, we won't fold. Get back to Love how God intended change to make this family. Even though this life is tough, that you gotta keep fighting. fighting. And even though it gets hard.